Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Lynn Saville as tonight's guest speaker. Lynn is best known for her photographs of cities at twilight and dawn. Currently her work is on view in a public art installation at Grand Central Terminal commissioned by the MTA. Uh, she is the author of three monographs, Dark City, Urban America at Night, Damiani 2015, and I believe you brought some copies of, of that book in case anybody's interested. Night Shift, Random House, uh, Monacelli, 2009, and Acquainted with the Night, Rizzoli, 1997. Awards include fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts and the New York State Council for the Arts, a premio in the Scano Italy Festival of Photography, and first place in the architecture category, Women in Photography International. Her photographs are in the permanent collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Art Institute of Chicago, International Center of Photography, ICP, National Portrait Gallery, London, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, among many others. So please help me welcome Lynn Saville to our lecture series. Tonight, I want to talk about, it's actually four books now. The last one came up pretty quickly. It's called Lost Series, from the Lost Series at New York. And um, it's a very little book compared to the others, but I'm proud of it anyway. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about the um, development of my photography, starting with the black and white series, which culminated in the first book, Acquainted with the Night. And Phil Freed, my husband, wrote, um, contributed to the book by uh, choosing poetry to go along with the pictures. It's not a picture and a photo, I mean a photo and a poem. It's a um, kind of a meditation on the night created by the text and the words and the pictures. My first recollection of appreciating the mysteries of night was looking at, out the window of my bedroom as a child in Nor North Carolina. We had a backyard and a lot of trees behind it. The feeling of the one single porch light looking out into the yard gave me a sense of uh, mystery that wasn't there during the daytime. I really appreciated that feeling and it kind of stayed with me and still stays with me as a, um, something special and very different from how life is during the day. Another special aspect of growing up was that we spent our summers in northern Vermont. It was very rural. And I love the simple shapes created by farms and barns. Um, this particular place, um, the owner said, would you like me to turn the lights on inside the barn? I said yes, and it really made all the difference in the world because it suddenly became a place that seemed full of memory and where you could sort of have dreams. Also, I just like the very simple shape of it and the kind of ultra basic architecture of it. I first encountered New York City as a child when my family traveled there here <laughs> to board the ship that would take us to Europe, this mysterious and enchanting place I was passing through. The city I did return to as a graduate student of photography came alive for me at twilight, when the streets and buildings seemed to dream their own dreams. Um, the, this is a picture of the Staten Island Ferry, and I was, um, when I took it, it reminded me of being five years old and on that ship going across the ocean because it was very dark, of course, and you, all you could see is like the horizon and the, the water. And at, on the ocean, you could just see the stars. And then this boat comes along and it's so stunningly um, human and, and alive. It, it really caught my heart. So when I happened to see the same thing on the Staten Island Ferry, I was happy that I was able to catch it with my camera. And that's 
because I had the camera ready, <laughs> not knowing that that's what I was going to see, but it just happened to be in my hand and set at the right shutter speed. Um, so I was grateful for the training I had as a student where they said, always be ready. Um, so these are some pictures I took at that time period. I'm influenced by several artists, one of whom is Hopper and also um, I like Degas. <laughs> and Hitchcock, I mean, I, I feel that this window reminded me of Hitchcock and Hopper. It's partly because of the wavy glass in the bottom pane. It sort of gave it this unreal quality. And, but I just really love being able to see the sky and the shapes coming into the window from across the street. What appealed to me about Degas was his, these, this is a monoprint, and I really like the way the, there's sort of like a grain to the highlights and the shadows from the, the print process that he used. And I really like that kind of light, the chiaroscuro. And so when I first saw his work, I sort of created my technique to go with that look in the final image. I mean, I did that in, with film, of course, <laughs> um, and film and printing in the darkroom. So it wasn't that I used a rough uh, surface paper, but I really liked the feeling of the grain kind of etching the shape and having a certain amount of detail in the highlight and the shadow. So I would always, you know, think about that when deciding how long to expose the negative and how to process the film and how to make the print. It was often a real push-pull between the highlights and the shadows and the contrast. I remember one time I took a picture to Dugal for some reason, I, I don't know why, but they were supposed to print it and somebody shouted, oh, it's a night picture, make it high contrast. And I said, no, 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 um, because I was kind of some contrast I wanted, but not just out and out contrast. So it's kind of like an internal contrast. Um, I, a lot of times I go to places where there are no people, and I think it's because there's so much sort of chaos in my brain during the day that going out and seeing this sort of pure, just shape, shape, light and shadow, appeals to me and gives me a sense of peace. And I also like looking at it and try to take a picture. So I'm often finding, looking for places where there are very few people. And I'm also sometimes scared. But I mean, I remember kind of running and stopping <laughs> just because I didn't, it was so dark and foggy that I didn't know if there was anyone lurking in the shadows. But it, it sort of added to my, the appeal of being there. A lot of time, it's sort of funny that I had a couple of weather-related pictures tonight. Um, I never really thought about taking a picture of Rockefeller Center until this one day. I was out and it was really, really nasty, you know, kind of sleet and fog and it was just the kind of night you would get soaking wet in a second. And I took a picture because it suddenly appeared to be like this hot iceberg or something. Um, it was so highly li lit that, and I thought it was so kind of macho, but it's also very beautiful. I had never really seen it like that. Of course, it's not just natural light. It's a lot of uh, lighting designers have um, put together the light to make it look that way, but it was in enhanced by the weather. This is kind of an homage to Bernice Abbott. I love that picture of hers, that just looking down from the Empire State Building, I think, into New York, and it just looks so electric. I look at that picture and I think electricity. And so I kind of intentionally went up there with my tripod and equipment, aiming to see if I could make a picture that looked like electricity. Um, it was actually very hard. 
to take any picture because it all looked the same. It just looked like a lot of light. Beautiful, but just no edge, you know, no shape or anything. So luckily I had several lenses with me and I was able to kind of isolate certain areas. And it was only weeks later that I decided I liked this picture. You know how sometimes you have to give it some time. And I realized that, yeah, there was something. <laughs> anyway, um, one of my absolutely favorite places in the whole city is the sculpture garden at the Metropolitan Museum. And this is, I think I've taken two or three pictures that are sort of favorites of mine up there. What struck me about this was suddenly it felt like a muse. It was um, this Gaston Lachaise sculpture and I just used a 35 millimeter lens and I really appreciated the way she seemed to be bigger than the buildings and the tiny little moon there. So it's been kind of a special photo for me. Um, and this picture I disregarded for years because I was very keen on having every single picture be clear with the tripod. And in this case, I had the tripod, but this person started walking and I thought it looked so great, and so I just had to keep running after her. And there was no time to put down the tripod because, you know, set it up because she was in the right spot. And so I just took the picture and I thought, oh no, it was blurry. But then later I realized it gave it animation. This is Fifth Avenue near the um, Museum of Modern Art, and many of the places I go to, I have repeatedly gone to over the years I've been in New York and I've really seen them change so much. Um, for example, there are tall buildings behind this church spire, so this picture couldn't be taken right now. But, you know, it's still okay. <laughs> they can change it. Or I should say we can change it. Um, another one of my absolute favorite photographers is Andre Cortez, and I felt that his, um, pictures of, had a sort of lyricism to them. And so when I, this is actually right in front of where uh, we live at 116th Street, and I really appreciated the way the park looked. Back in that time, I was very scared to go into a park. I thought I'd be killed or raped instantly. And, um, <laughs> well, not instantly, but you know, I didn't think it was gonna be a good idea <laughs> to go in there. And um, so I just never would set foot even two feet into a park. And then finally one day, well, the city got a little safer. And also a friend of mine told me how to, how to go into a park. And it was really helpful kind of to choose the time, the place, the route, and make sure that you sort of know where people are and don't tune out, don't like go in La La Land. And so knock on wood, so far I've been okay. Um, but the parks are really quite striking at night. <coughs> I put this one in as the last one from Acquainted with the Night because I've been, as um, Jaime mentioned, I have this public art show in Grand Central, so it's kind of, I'm sort of very fond of Grand Central right now. But I'll get to that at the end of the presentation. So the, after this series, I had some shows and very proud of the book. Um, and I felt like I had taken so many pictures and I really thought I'd always be just a strictly black and white photographer. But I needed to do something different and so I tried just about anything. <laughs> you know, I tried the circus, <laughs> I tried um, color slides, you know, just er tried anything. And what sort of clicked with me, pardon the photo pun, was the um, color. Um, and so I started working in color and it was a huge departure for me. It was like suddenly um, a whole nother thing. Um, so this picture really dates almost the same time as the, some of the black and white ones. It was very close. And I don't know if many of you remember when the business folks in the city decided to renovate Times Square. It's like huge, it was really, really big. And it, um, 
meant that they took over, this is literally 42nd Street between 7th and 8th. It, it was absolutely empty and scary. There was prostitution, all kinds of, you know, muggers, pickpockets. You know, you really felt you were taking your life in your own hands just walking into 42nd Street. And um, a friend of mine and I decided to try to take some pictures there. And so I was taking pictures of a picture of the boarded up all the storefronts along 42nd. And suddenly somebody walked in front of the camera. And I was, first I sort of cursed under my breath. And then I realized they'd made the picture better. And this became like, has become a sub theme for me, which has developed into more of a main theme recently how, you know, a figure could enhance the sense of the picture. Smith and Ninth Street is a place where I love this subway station, and it's actually where I got the final decision, made the final decision to switch to color because I went there with the black and white and color. And it was, um, it, it was interesting that I was able to take a reasonable picture in color. I've put in a couple of pictures from other countries. This is in uh, France. I had a funny experience because Bill and I were going to Paris. I didn't put any uh, French black and white pictures in, or Venice, but those are some that I like a lot. So we'd been going over to Europe a few times and I was taking pictures and then when I had the color, I was thinking color, we were on the airplane and I said, I wonder what Paris is gonna look like in color. And he said, honey, it's always in color. I mean, I literally was thinking black and white. I just saw that city in black and white. Um, anyway, my, um, I really love Van Gogh. I know I, I'm not alone, <laughs> but I just felt that he pulled the stops out of the color, like he just let it sing. And I really appreciated that. And I don't know how many of you ever go to Arles. This is a cafe in Arles. Well, of course, they're very proud of Van Gogh, and they actually have this cafe is still there. So you could literally almost take this picture there. Um, because the way they have it set up, but um, I just really love the, I guess that's what got me really started in color was the um, man-made or human color being warm as and its complement being the daylight, even in the evening, more so in the evening. So the, the blue and the, the warm and the cool, I find very um, haunting. Um, so I'll just, this is from Night Shift. In part of my introduction to the second book, I said, gradually I began to explore the more ambiguous tra transitional zones of the city apart from its icons. I started to see and photograph such places in color. So I went more, I never made a rule. Wait, why is that in there? Sorry, <laughs> um, I never made a rule that I couldn't photograph icons. I just felt drawn more to the edges of town, especially as the industry was fading from the this city and there were more, um, it was the beginning of gentrification, but there were a lot of artists and it just seemed kind of interesting as it was less industrial. And the colors were fascinating. Uh, the, this was taken with motion sensitive light and so it took me a long time. I had to keep waiting for the lights to circle because if I just moved a little bit it would start all over again. Here's somebody walked through the picture on the edge and I found that interesting. This picture, um, this is that warehouse that has now become West Elm and is quite uh, you know, gentrified now, it's all fancy. But it was lit like this briefly for maybe just two weeks or something. I think it was somebody's art project. But it reminded me of um, De Chirico. I just love his work. I saw it as a child. And so I felt, you know, really inspired by anything that looked that graphic. 
and mysterious, kind of surreal. Many times the things wouldn't be there the next night. I wanted to go back and take this picture again and it wasn't available. <laughs> they had filled up that um, garage with stuff and it just didn't have the same feeling. I, brought, I wanted to come back with a bigger camera. And this is the, what's now the St. Anne's uh, Theater. And this is snow. I felt kind of really drawn to this particular old warehouse because it, well, I think it's partly because I grew up in North Carolina and we had a lot of tobacco warehouses and factories right around the school and in town. Like it was, it, this type of architecture was everywhere. And to see it still here in New York kind of held as a temple of the past, I found fascinating. I was kind of disappointed when they filled it up with the theater, though I'm sure that people enjoy the theater. It just, it looked really nice, just kind of as a relic of another era, like the Roman Forum. And Ken is in the audience. <laughs> um, we went photographing thinking it was gonna be very, um, I don't know, misty and romantic and beautiful. And we got there and it was a night sort of like this outside. But it was fun to take, to have you to take a picture of. <laughs> I think you have a good picture of the bridge. Um, that's the George Washington Bridge. I th see the, um, some of the urban architecture as like an exoskeleton. Love the shapes and colors, that, the palette of it. This is um, Fish House Road on, does anybody know where that is? It's, on, it's in New Jersey. It's uh, the Hackensack River, and a couple of my students were standing on the left and right, and I thought they looked more interesting in the picture than not in the picture. So again, I had the figures. And Carney. One of the things that appeals to me about um, taking pictures like this is that sometimes everything looks almost like black and white, but then if you shine some light either from a car or a, a torch or something, it adds dimension. People describe that in the mountains too, like if it's really dark you can't see, but if you shine the light then you have a path of color, otherwise it looks just kind of monochromatic. A, um, I was with a class and um, Everybody was busy and didn't seem to want me to talk. So I just started to take a picture myself and all of a sudden this young woman walked into her house. And I was really close. I mean, it looks far, but it's a wide angle. And I was surprised how perfect she looked <laughs> walking in there. Uh, Lichtenstein on top of the Metropolitan Museum and I was I snuck a little tiny tripod and was trying really hard to get the house with nobody in it and this guy made it so much better and so did the little people on the side but I sat there for a long time you know I took a whole roll of film I think and I don't know what I thought it was I mean I guess I thought it would look better empty but it really didn't. So I call that ghosting. Um, sometimes I just look around on the internet to get ideas of places to go. I would never wanted to go to Long Island City or see the Pepsi sign. I didn't have any interest and I didn't know where to go one night so I said okay I'll just go there and I felt that it was lucky because they happened to be digging up the whole area so it looked like a farm that suddenly this sign came out of and it was really special to me. Normally I wouldn't have cared to photograph the sign. 
I was over there a couple of nights ago, and it's really so different now because they've moved it right in front of a, well, they built a lot of buildings and they moved it, but it's still a pretty, pretty iconic sign. And I'm glad it's there. But I was happy that I had that opportunity to kind of suddenly smell earth like a farm and <laughs> see the Pepsi sign in the city. Um, and this was a self-assignment to try for symmetry. And I thought the city was teasing me because I had everything lined up, but then there was just one light on, so <laughs> threw it off. It also resonates because, you know, as a kid, when we went to Europe, we go to the Alhambra and all these kind of places, and it, I just really appreciated the arches and the classic architecture, so it's kind of fun to see where you still see that in, in New York. And from the tram. The publisher humored me and let me put this as the last picture in the book because it felt like I was driving on to something next, you know, another road trip. So the third book is Dark City, and I'll just read a short thing that from there. Um, I can't memorize things too well. Um, I became intrigued by an urban cycle of growth and decay whose symbols of renewal included the ladder and the broom. Although my photographs have frequently captured unpopulated urban scenes at twilight and dawn, a single, sometimes ghosted figure has occasionally emphasized the solitary lostness of the place, and I began introducing such figures into my work. Although my work is not consciously documentary, I often seek out somewhat desolate scenes, and sometimes it appears as if I'm follow, followed by the wrecking ball as once abandoned areas are gentrified. So in a sense, my photographs do constitute a record of the city in its unraveling and being sewn up again. This is probably the only occasion, well, maybe there's one in the last book, but this is one of the few times I actually asked for permission to get into a place, and this is a construction site when they were making the Brooklyn Bridge Park. I was in a panic because I only had like an hour. This young woman was doing me a favor and I had to work fast. So I had all this bigger equipment and I couldn't even take the time. I just had to use the easiest equipment. And I was glad I did because I, it was just so interesting. The reason I asked for the permission to get in there is that tree, I had coveted it from a distance. Mm -hmm. And at every angle had it cut off by that one of those warehouses. So I just said, okay, the tree looks perfect, now is the time. And I got permission and went over there. And I really appreciate, I guess kind of like that Pepsi sign, I, I like to see the dirt. And um, just the feeling, it's not so much I, I'm crazy about construction sites, but I like the feeling of the earth being turned because I really spend a lot of time in Manhattan and the boroughs, and I don't get out into the, you know, rural landscape where you see a lot of earth. So I find it really exciting when you do see earth and weeds and plants that aren't just all groomed. Um, my original concept for, you know, you get involved in a project and it kind of takes its own path. And the original idea was to call it vacancy. And I was, and I didn't say I'm gonna go shoot vacancy, but that's just what I was seeing. And it was really interesting visually, seeing all these empty stores back in around 2006 and seven when the economy was not doing too well. And even on Madison Avenue, many, many stores were empty. So it was, you could see right into the the interior and it had no products, no signage, nothing, no rugs, and it was quite fascinating. Then I, but I thought it was a kind of a sad topic and I was kind of worried about it. And, but I kept going anyway, I couldn't help it. And I noticed that there were optimistic signs that you would actually see in a ladder. They were fixing it up or, you know, they were painting it. And what interested me here was that my back is to the Hudson and this is up at 125th Street and so all these lights are, the ones on the right are reflected from 
Jersey, and then the other lights are from the street. So there was no like actual light in it, but it was creating such an abstract <coughs> pattern. So I found the colors uh, interesting. And also this project was uh, helped me see a new kind of architecture that I'd never really paid any attention to. It's kind of more contemporary architecture. I usually don't really care to, I mean, I don't mind it's there. I just would never think of taking a picture. Um, and light sources, I really, I love Dan Flavin lighting. Some of the light masters I really appreciate. James Terrell. So to see actual bulbs like that or as part of the way the space is configured, I find fascinating. And then these kind of original minded real estate people who actually have a portable sign that says space for rent looks like neon. It is neon. And it's kind of funny because I don't know if you all paid attention in that time period, but there were so many empty stores that like half a block could be black almost. It was very dark. So to have the neon sign, it was like added excitement. So people would actually look at the building or look at the block. You know, this was only a few blocks from Times Square. And anyway, I thought it was pretty interesting that it was a lighted sign. And of course, technically, it is a bit challenging to photograph a dark space with neon in it. And I worked on it. <laughs> the rain helped. And this was actually the very first picture I took for this project. And it's very close to the Met Breuer. And I was just really excited to see the glow from inside the building and the simple, almost um, abstract shapes of the front of the building. I have always admired from afar, you know, Walker Evans, but I never thought a head-on picture would be something I would be interested in taking. But with this picture, it made me understand what he was, how he kind of respected the, the simple shapes of the place. Not that all of his pictures are head-on, but this was an accidental double exposure. It seemed to, this, oh, in, in this, this, this book, I went to different American cities. This is in Columbus, Ohio. And this is in Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to go to malls, but this particular <coughs> mall I just happened to be at, and it, was, it gave me an appreciation for that kind of place with all the signage removed and the sort of almost looked like fake stars. It seemed like a, a piece from the past. Cleveland, it seemed like a dream. The banner, the city was dreaming, dreaming to create. I, um, this is in Santa Monica. It made me think of Julia Shulman, but I didn't have the model, <laughs> the models. I really appreciate the way you could see through the building, though. In Bushwick, where they put pink light on these warehouses to appeal to the young students. And I think it worked. <laughs> Red Hook. Although there's not a figure, I felt that the light caused the place to seem more interesting and um, mysterious than it would have without the light on. It's in Ohio. And this is a Dumbo. The light is coming from the bridge and that's why it has that shape. It's very noisy as the subway goes across, but visually it's quite appealingly quiet. I decided to include this picture of a mannequin because it seemed like the figure had landed from some other 
from a spaceship or something, and I just felt that it made it feel like a empty place, even though the figure was there. This is a kind of a renewal area very close to where we live near Columbia University. Every day it looked a little different. It was easy to get there because it was so close, so I'd pass by there often. Portland, Maine. I guess it's a little different from the others because it's not empty, but it felt empty. Though the figure helped. <laughs> this is Gowanus. Newburgh. I'm going to show you another picture from taken from the same place at the end of the slideshow really appreciated this place. Um, sometimes when I go to another city, I'll drive around with someone, I'll hire somebody or ask a friend who will, you know, will just go around. And we went all over Newburgh and I just love this one corner. And then I said, well, let's try all the different corners in this area, but it was just this one corner <laughs> that really got me. And I think it's because the barn seems to be levitating, kind of. And it's funny because somebody said, well, why don't you see what what it is, and it's kind of like I don't even want to know. I just really like the way it looks, and it reminds me of that early um, barn picture I took in black and white. Just the very, very simple shape, and probably, honestly, what happened is maybe this was a farm, you know, and then this was a warehouse on the left, and, you know, little by little, the city is sort of coming out to the, to the farm, and that just whoever owns it just still kept it. Whatever the reason, I like the uh, contrast in architecture and the way the light is portraying it. And this is Houston. I find it interesting when you have a major metropolis and very close by are like warehouses. I mean, I know it's obvious that people had a um, industry, but it's such a different kind of architecture and it, the lines are so clear, like where one neighborhood stops and the next begins. I would say this uh, attracted me because it, of the way the light fell on the building and the color. This was about a week before they destroyed this building. And I think this was like a few steps before that J.C. Penney that I showed you in the mall in Columbus. Because, you know, this, they had just been serving food and then they moved out and then they took the signage off. And I caught it right when they still had the light on. Um, I guess I was just lucky because the awning. I wouldn't have taken the picture without the light on the awning. But then instantly, you know, next day it was gone and then the awning was gone and then the building was gone. So it's like crazy to see how the city like dismantles itself. This is, um, of course, the High Line. And I said before I really like around the, um, like the Pepsi sign in these rural areas that are in the city. And when the High Line first opened, that's what excited me about it. I don't know about everybody else, but I really loved that, seeing those weeds and the way they lighted it so beautifully. And so that's what I was thinking when I took this picture of those weeds and then this little kid ran in and she made the picture way better because the ones I have without her weren't as good. I didn't know her, she just ran in and ran out and that was it, one shot. But um, I still 
really appreciate the way that park has developed and how carefully they've lighted it. And some lighting designers I know told me that when you see different colored lights like this, it's because why? Age of the bulbs. <laughs> but I had a really clear view out a window of a hotel. Yeah, Houston. Photo Fest. Did you Florida ever go? <laughs> it was a relief from the chaos of the Photo Fest to take a picture out my window. But the fog helped. And I really try to avoid my own shadow, but I couldn't get it. I couldn't get the picture without my shadow being in there. Who knew I had a long neck? <laughs> It's funny how so many people take selfies and like their own shadow and stuff. I'm just kind of shy about it. Um, so the last couple from this book, it's a billboard. I took this, it was the first time I ever used a high ISO. Um, we were, took one of those cheap buses to Washington, D.C. I think it was a blizzard and we had to because the Amtrak was out. And um, I saw the billboard and I said, I gotta get a picture of that coming back. But the windows were tinted and it was dawn. I mean, I had to set my camera, my Nikon at that time, on an ISO 7000 or something to get this picture and, and pray. It was like I was sitting there waiting with my velvet over the, to keep the reflection. It took some work. Get, I mean, this was a very fast ISO for when I took this picture. So um, I had to work on the noise. But I guess what the reason it connected to the project was it was not only the vacancy of these places, but the billboard was even vacant. And it gave me a sense of the eastern seaboard that you often do see from the trains or you see from the car. And it too is changing. You know, they've demolished a lot of that landscape, their industrial landscape. And this is the last picture from this book. I think they humored me on this one too. <laughs> I call it Meadowlands, and it's, um, I took it from a train, and it was just such a special place with the fog, and it, I just really liked the kind of Japanese quality of that landscape. Actually, I'm gonna go out on a boat trip in the Hackensack. They have a river keepers, and I don't know if any of you ever done that, but you could take a tour and it's like, it's like taking a boat into an estuary. It's really quite, it's gonna be good, I think. Okay, on to the last book. My new, new book. I was, it's very different from the other books in that it, um, usually I work for years and then pull together a project and try and look for a publisher. But in this case, um, Chris Graves project, he's a young entrepreneurial publisher, decided to do a series of books very quickly on cities. And he said, Lynn, you wanna do New York? I said, yes. <laughs> and he hit me at a good time because I had more time than I sometimes have. And it was around Thanksgiving. And so there was no real time to shoot the whole book or anything. So he said, pull together things that you haven't published, you know, that you'd like to put together into the book. And then he, somebody else, Lois Connor, did Beijing. Uh, Laura McBee did Calcutta. She wanted to call it Cool Kata. <laughs> we were saying, where's that? <laughs> but um, it was, and some people, you know, so we have Omaha, Seattle. It's a really cool series of books. There were 10 of them. And it all, they all had to be turned in at New Year's. You know, we were asked in the beginning of December and yet a month. Wow, is that thunder? Yeah. Whoa. Here. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so um, I said yes. So I also, at the about a little bit before that, I had been invited, as Jaime mentioned, uh, to do a commission for the MTA Arts for Transit. And they asked me to photograph the um, revealed facade, it's called the revealed western facade of Grand Central Terminal. You're not supposed to say station. Um, and you all probably saw it, right? They, demolished a whole block of the city, right in the heart of the city, which made 
Grand Central visible from in its own glory all by itself. And it felt like a town square. I mean, people would stop and put down their bags and get out their cell phones the minute they got to Madison Avenue if they were heading toward Grand Central and hadn't seen this before. So it was really exciting that I was asked to do this. So now the, so they demolished this whole block and dug deep down into the earth. And at one point I saw five, um, what do you call them? Bulldozers or something, huge piece of equipment all together in that space. And they were practically a ballet, you know, like, one actually held the other up when it was coming down an incline. It started to list a little bit, and he went and pushed this friend. I mean, it was really amazing, but it's also kind of really sad that this building is going to be as big as, the, you know, bigger than the Empire State Building, or as big, very tall. And it's already up at like seven floors, so you can't see any of this anymore. But I'm honored that they gave me the project, and then, and the result is there's um, light boxes eight of them in the basement, I mean in the concourse, food concourse of Grand Central, and they'll be there for three years. If you want to know how to see it, you should ask me because it's hard to find, very hard to find. Okay, so this is, so I had permission to go into different buildings, and this is a little different from my usual art project because I usually just shoot from the street or do my own thing, but this was a, an assignment, and so it's more documentary in nature, but I found it really compelling. So I would ask buildings for access to windows. This window actually, it actually opened. You could, which was the first one, I had to shoot through a lot of glass. I, of course, I had velvet, but you know I had to be very careful. They didn't have any you know, view without the glass. Um, so I just I put in a few into this book. Um, this is from Madison, and this view is no longer available either because my back was to the new construction, and it used to be that you could get this gorgeous reflection of the Chrysler in the windows, but now it's just the building. I mean, the building may be special too, but so a nod toward my people are the mannequins. And here's how the installation looks, except their tables and chairs. That's one side, and that's the other side. And they're huge. They all had to be crop vertical, but that's the way it is with the light boxes. They're about 50 by 60 inches. Okay, here are some pictures from Lost. Um, at the 9th Street. So I think I have three pictures I, get, I like of Smith and 9th Street, practically from the same spot. <laughs> One's in black and white, I didn't show you. And does this look familiar? <laughs> My friend Ken let me borrow his Sony, and we went up into the Ferris wheel. What was special for me, which may be the case for many of you who have tried the mirrorless cameras, is that now I could use a higher ISO and get a very clear picture of people because it's sharp and you could use a faster shutter speed. It's a big, big, big difference from using film at lower ISOs. This was my homage to Stephen Shore. I just seen his, his show and was out in Industry City. It kind of, it's still kind of raw. Some, any of you looking for raw places? My old haunt, Dumbo. Hudson Yards. That's pretty crazy. Do you ever go there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. 
one of my favorite places in Central Park, Bow Bridge. Sometimes the color is a surprise, like it, sometimes it just really looks yellow. I, I mean, the, the whole thing, it looked like a platinum, sort of yellowish platinum print when I turned the corner past the trees and I saw this. And it was really tough to print because I didn't believe it. You know, it's like, <laughs> I kept saying, no, it really was. I feel like I need a color meter so, so I could prove to myself, yes. But I guess I could do that other ways, right? <laughs> Take your class. So here are some of my students, Bethesda. I think Ken recognizes about three or four pictures, right? If not more. Um, okay, the last two is from, I'm really fond of elevated subways. This is at 125th Street. And then here's one that's not in any book, but I put it in because I went back and tried to find some more corners in New Bergen. I just, oh, and it had changed. It was only maybe six or eight months, and the, the building now had tenants. It was a warehouse, and now it has tenants. And the other light is off that was on the corner on the right, and my friend Jill kindly went and stood there. So that's all, folks. <laughs>
a five by seven black and white pictures and Phil and I went up to a hotel that had two, two double beds and white comforter <laughs> and we locked the door and just put all the pictures all around so we could go round and round and we didn't even care. It could be like India, it could be Fifth Avenue, it could be Vermont, you know, like it wasn't, the sequence had nothing to do with the location and, and then the poetry that Phil chose had its own dialogue with that. But in other words, I went to every old, any place. It was really about the night, purely the night. And then the second book, uh, Mana, because Mana, well, that was Rizzoli, and they were happy with it. The way I did it, they didn't argue with it. The um, second publisher, I showed them a lot of color pictures, but you know, I had like three from Paris and all of them were from New York except like one or two and they said let's just do greater New York area. And also they're kind of known for New York, more New York oriented books so it sort of was a match. If I had said no you must have the French pictures they might not have minded but it really conceptually made sense after the fact. And then the third book I, as I said I started as like a vacancy as the idea of these empty stores but then it sort of, I wanted to make it a little broader because I noticed that there were whole areas that seemed more vacant. And I felt that it made it, the project stronger to have, not call it vacancy, because I always think of that with a motel, and instead make it um, about sort of the feeling of vacancy. And then darks, I mean, um, <laughs> this book, um, I really looked deeply into my files because I literally only had a few weeks and so I really, really edited and and it was I wanted to include some of the Grand Central but I didn't want the whole book to be Grand Central. And um, so I just kept picking pictures that, would, <coughs> that looked good visually but that didn't have um, a location theme as precise as the other books. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, starting out with four or five pictures of Grand Central already puts it into sort of a, an, you know, iconic space. So that all the pictures somehow have a little bit of reference to the center of town as opposed to the edge. And so it's kind of refreshing. It was also way smaller. You know, it's this little book and very precisely, um, you know, there's no page numbers. You know, it's, it, I mean, he designed this. So it's a very, very different experience putting together the book and seeing it than the other ones. And it was kind of nice doing one so quickly. I, I'm intrigued by the, that you're going around while we're sleeping. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you know, and it's sort, of, it's sort of interesting to imagine you out there. Do you feel safer now? And, and how long, much time do you spend on each location? I guess I do feel safer, but every once in a while I get the heebie-jeebies. I mean, I once, I don't know where, like jury duty or something, I met this woman who was a cop and she said, oh, it, things are really dangerous at dawn. It's like, don't, you know, a lot of bad things happen at dawn, so it's like, I don't feel as safe <laughs> as I used to. But um, years ago I was mugged at gunpoint, but I wasn't taking pictures. I was just kind of like in my own head and this guy was sitting on a stoop and he came up and I was like, scary, lucky, he got some money, but he didn't, he didn't get me, you know, it's like, and I was like, ever since then, if you came up behind me at noon in Times Square, I would turn around and look at you. I mean, I'm very aware and cautious now. I don't go into that lovely space of fantasy that I would prefer to go into, but I can't just wander around like a, you know, dreamer. Um, but I, like with, I mean, I, when I said I've, it's safer, I think if any of you want to go out into a park, you should really bring a few people. And also keep an eye on each other because, not that something's probably going to happen, but I mean, people get lost and you wander around and you don't know. So I think it's really good to turn around and look and see and maybe bring a flashlight. I know it sounds crazy, or make sure your cell phone does. Like it, Bethesda Fountain, it's literally pitch black. You can't even see that there's a step to go down. You know, it's really, really, really dark when it's night. 
underneath the terrace bridge, it's beautifully lighted, but when you get toward the fountain, it's really, really dark. So I would say you really should buddy up if you want to try this. Um, and don't go to the more remote parks of parts of parks, such as Fort Tryon Park has a lot of trees and I think some kids hang out there and stuff, but they might be fine. It's just that you should really bring at least one or two people so that you have company. And I well, also... Bring large people. <laughs> <laughs> also, I don't flaunt the camera. You know, I don't go around, though my big scary friend carries his Leica, like, you know, he's not afraid because he knows he's, people probably are afraid of him. But um, I usually hide it, you know, I put it under the coat, my jacket. I bring a special jacket that I can hide it under, or I, I actually collapse a tripod, or mm -hmm. I don't go around like an obviously taking a picture person, <laughs> um, if there's such a word. And uh, what else? So I do go out more. And you know what's strange? It's like if you take the subway at like 4 a.m., it's full. Sometimes you can't even, you can't even sit. There could, they have them so spaced out that, it, you know, timed, that literally you might not be able to sit down because there's so many people on it. So, and there's plenty of like construction workers and stuff. It's just a whole different group of people. Actually, I would just wanted to add about offbeat times is that, you know, some of Hopper's most famous paintings, you know, that early Sunday morning, there's like nobody there. It's like, don't you think if you went out on 7th Avenue, like yeah. near, um, near NYU, that there'd be somebody out? So he must have really made a practice out of going out at early times. And certainly the light is beautiful. And also, one thing I didn't really emphasize in this talk is that I like to feel that the city is my own sometimes, you know, and that's, so when I go out alone and find these empty places, what's appealing is that it's just like a kind of mine. And I really like that. It's very, you just see it really clearly. You don't have to deal with the other people. It's just really kind of different than it is when there's just tons of people, because, you know, we're all looking at each other. So, but, the, but it's also fun to see the figures. You started the talk by talking about that emptiness of the city and, and the, 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 you know, the special relationship, contemplative relationship that you have with it. Uh, but I also feel like you've started warming up to the human figure more and more. Yes. And, uh, but in a kind of elliptical way, not directly, uh, except for the very last picture where you said, well, I asked my friend yeah. to go and stand there. And, and one of my favorite photographers, um, in terms of nighttime photography, is Brassai. Yes. And I was Brassai. wondering if, you know, either you tried that and that was one of the things that you threw out uh, when you were trying things. You, you mentioned you tried just about everything you could think of. Did you ever try a portraiture project at night? At night? I'm not against it. I really am not. I think I might try. Okay. But, you know, uh, do you work in black and white or color or both? Both. Both. You do? But my, my first love is black and white. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think it's definitely appealing in both at night. It's such a treat. I mean, I don't know how many of you really learned in film, but, you know, we really used to have to make up our minds ahead of time. Like, you had a roll of film in your camera. You didn't typically have two rolls. I mean, two cameras. So some people went back and forth, but usually people were kind of di distinctly, is that a word, distinctively, well, they were either one or the other. And so the, it's, a, it's a luxury to be able to switch back and forth. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you all.